Lulu's now the good luck dog. You would say that there's no question this weekend was absolutely fortunate luck, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The following is a production of Dirty Mo Media. Hey guys, welcome to Actions Detrimental. I'm Denny Hamlin, driver of the number 11 FedEx One Rate uh, Toyota this past weekend at Talladega Super Speedway. And welcome to the Spin the Wheel uh, episode where we have so many topics. If you saw my tweet last night, you know we don't know where to start. So we're just going to let the wheel start for us. And to be frank, this wheel isn't even big enough to fit all the topics. So I, I think all of them are important. So I, I think we kind of got to lead off. I, I mean, again, I just I want to say thank you to NASCAR for giving us this content. Um, I want to make sure that the listeners out there tune in to all Dirty Mo media podcasts this week because you will get a unbiased and unfiltered reaction to these subjects. Um, I honestly, I, I can't see how some of the, uh, the other channels spin this in a very positive light, but it'll be very interesting to see how that how that goes. Um, Jared, let's just talk first, I guess, about uh, Sammy Smith. <laughs> <laughs> okay. S- Sammy Smith, Xfinity race winner. Yep. 12th place to first place, can't make the yep. wheel. I would say on a normal episode, this would be a big topic. The guy went from the seller of the Xfinity playoffs to winning and putting himself into the next round. And now we've got some big names below the um, the cut line for it is a cut race for them too as well, right? It should be. Don't they follow your schedule from here on out? Okay. I'm I'm not sure. Not sure. Maybe. Well, Who there's knows? only five races left. So I mean, you have to. the amount of cars that it, it's different. The races is different. <laughs> I. Good luck. I mean, I'm in the I'm in the sport, and I don't know. You would call me an avid fan. I mean, no idea. Mathematically, they have to. Yes, it's the be, cutoff <laughs> because okay. there's only five it's races left. Uh, who do we got to blow the cutoff in Xfinity right now? There, Trav. Uh, he's doing some clicking. Uh, we have Al Geyer, SVG, Sam Mayer, Parker Kligerman. Mm. Well, I mean, given the way that the format in the um, the Xfinity series is going it's you would think svg's just got an automatic bid to the next round (laughs) because he's got a road course he's about to go to um i think he's probably 13 points back there was a big dq at the end of it obviously um who was that who got dq sam mayer right his car didn't pass tech the rear was too low and that dq really changed some things so now the svg's the justin algars can really kind of point their way in relatively easily uh, compared to where they were. I think they were t- more than 20 back. SVG so. is 10 back, but also uh, right above the cut line is Almendinger. Who- oh, wow. Yeah, so so I think the Xfinity playoffs is just going to be uh, very interesting to watch when we get to the Roval. Uh, you're going to have, you guys are going to have to keep me tidied on some of these subjects. Um you know, I have a goal of where I want this podcast to land. Then you better wrap up this extended okay. series talk. <laughs> okay. So let's give props to, to Sammy Smith for winning. Uh, I thought he did a great job there at the end, kind of working the draft. Obviously, um, the Xfinity cars are so fun to watch on, on super speedways because it's the racing that we used to have in Cup Series. We didn't put in there on our, um, on our wheel of topics kind of the – cup arrow package that desperately desperately needs some work um but that's nor here nor there we got too many other things to talk about and um and so i think that uh yeah it's fun to watch those things they got bubbles behind the car so you can push the car forward without actually pushing them um it's more spread out you can make moves and so uh really as a fan fun to watch the xfinity series Okay, let's spin this wheel. Travis, are right, you, you ready to move are on? Are you ready over there? I'm ready. Well, we want to keep it moving here, right? Want to keep it moving. All right, Travis, here we go. First spin. 
And the winner is... Oh, God. Right off. No way. <laughs> Lawsuit. <laughs> Stop it. Is that wheel loaded? Do we want to spit again and save this for the end? No. No, I, I think it's fine. Okay. <clears throat> but, I mean, on the first on the first spin? I know. I know. I was hoping that I was going to get to spin this again in the next five minutes, but now I might spin it again in the next 30 minutes. <sighs> All right. <clears throat> I mean, what do y'all want to know? <laughs> I mean, I just feel like, you know, this weekend, I, I obviously didn't say much in the media center. Uh, I have to be respectful that, it, you know, while at the racetrack there, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm the driver of the eleven first um and obviously you want to keep your comments pretty short and limited um you know to be respectful to you know the sponsors i got on my hat and my shirt uh, during that time it's that's the tough balance but when people ask me about you know what's the balance i say that's one of the toughest is having to walk that tightrope of well I'm, I'm here as a driver but you're asking me owner questions but i want to be respectful and answer your questions right so um, I mean, I don't know. What do y'all want to know about it? Obviously, a lot has been um, said about it. Obviously, you heard our attorneys, um, you know, did a did a few media outlets uh, last week. Obviously, this is a big deal for the sport. Um, you know, this is just something that I feel as though that is important moment in our sport. Uh, for myself personally, you know, I've invested a lot back into this sport to, um, to help put on, uh, NASCAR show. And, you know, all I've asked them from the very beginning is that show me an avenue, um, where I can get that investment back. I'm not looking to <clears throat> bank a bunch of money or anything like that. I just show me a way that that investment can be recouped. And, and I've not seen that yet. And so that is a, that is an issue, right? And so when we heard NASCAR say, well, we don't want big investment companies coming into our sport. We want we want old drivers being car owners. They tried it and it failed for one reason or another. So when's it stop? When does it stop? We 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 came and when we we brought out facts that in 2016 there were 19 charter members. Uh, 11 of those are gone. They're gone. And so I know it's easy to look in the short term and say, oh, we're fine. Everything's fine. It's not fine. And the 2025 agreement binds the teams in such a way that there is no upside whatsoever. All the upside goes to one side and all of our rights are taken away. So any way that we did have in the past a way or an avenue to at least use our rights, our rights, that we created brands that we created IP that we created to then go get other revenue to supplement this, this thing called a racing team. Those got taken away. So it's just, it's just a broken system. And I, and I wish people understand how broken the system is. I think as time goes on and things get discovered, you will see more specifics on why we believe that this is an unfair system and an unfair agreement. Uh, you obviously saw Richard Childress. You know he he stated his um, opinions on it, which is just drives me up the wall. Why these talking heads say, "Well, all these other people signed it." Well, no, they yeah they did, but they're telling you why. Why are you ignoring them saying? I didn't want to, but I had no choice. So it only take, you know, Jeffrey Kessler definitely stated it very perfectly that there's always more victims than the plaintiffs. Uh, it happened in NIL. It happened in, in different sports that it only takes one to stand up for what they believe in. And this is something I stand up and I believe in. I want this for my kids. They deserve to carry on the legacy of what I've invested back in the sport. So be careful what you wish for. It's a it it should be fair for everyone. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. That's teams, drivers, sponsors, and fans. I'm curious if this is <clears throat> this lawsuit, is this something that was always on 2311 and 
you know, I don't want to not include front row in this, was it something that was always on your mind as these charter discussions went on through the summer? Or was this like, man, this is the only thing we got once September 6th came yeah. and you got that final proposal? Yeah, I mean, things happened really quick in that week of September 6th, obviously. Um, and some details will come out of that. You know, again, as, as things go along and progress, um, you will see more information and facts and, and understand why this is so bad. Um, but specifically, it, September 6th was, I think Michael talked about it, Curtis talked about it, Jeffrey Kistler talked about it, Bob Jenkins talked about it. That was the straw that broke the camel's back when essentially you know you get this document that by the way your lawyers just had the first opportunity to talk 24 hours before that and then all of a sudden you must sign this and that we're done we're done and it just doesn't you know that was the straw bro broke the camel's back and at that point you know when NASCAR put that clause in the very, you know, I, I'm not speaking out of turn here because I know that all these things are now public now. They put in there at the last, in the 12th hour of the agreement, they put in there, you may not sue us. If you sign this, you cannot sue us for anything basically that we have done through this process. You can't sue us for antitrust, can't sue it. So, so they take away, they took away all your, all of our rights, all of our rights. So at that point we said, hold on, stop. We can't sign this. Because we know this is wrong, but if we if we do, we we release them of any wrongdoing, and they they've had wrongdoings. Do you, do you think NASCAR knows it's wrong, which is why they would have included that statement? I think to a normal common person, it's a pretty big red flag. Would you not think? I mean, yeah. If you if you include that, hey, if you sign this, you can't sue us for anything that we've done in this process or whatever it may be mm -hmm. i would think that's a red flag but it, did they include it, that it was, because they know it's a red flag would i i can't i don't know i can't really speak for them and, and they're you know why that was put in there but obviously it's you know they wanted to protect themselves we obviously have not had any comments from nascar regarding this lawsuit yet right um things move slow in this process though what does this mean for 2311 in front row for the remainder of this year going into next season. Yeah. So I think that obviously, you know, we, we stated that, uh, we'll be filing for an injunction. Um, and you know, that's the first, that's the first thing that has to happen. Um, the injunction is basically, we're going to seek relief. Um, and in injunctions, you typically have to show, uh, and again, I'm not a lawyer, so be careful here. Um, that you know you have irreparable harm if something if you don't stop it and so obviously we're trying to stop nascar from um, taking our charters obviously there would be massive irreparable harm there um, and so you know we're going to go to the courts and say listen let us operate as a chartered team while this lawsuit goes on over the next you know year to two years um, because obviously if you lose your charters and you win the lawsuit, <laughs> then what? You can't you can't go back. Um, so it's going to be tough. Um, I think uh, to to operate that way. We're we're as twenty three eleven. Um, we're prepared for any outcome. I think Michael has stated that, and and I've stated to the team, um, we will not let this affect our employees whatsoever in any kind of way in any financial distress is going to have to fall directly on the owners. It will not fall on our people whatsoever. We will not allow that to happen. I'm curious of your thoughts on some of your competitors' comments this weekend. Kyle Larson was asked about this in the media center. He commented on driver salaries and NASCAR driver salaries being one of, if not the only sport where they've gone down in the last handful <clears throat> of years. Brad Kozlowski also commented on this. He was a team owner who was a not a team owner who is now a team owner again. Um, mm -hmm. what do your what's your take on, on those guys comments? Yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, Kyle Larson's right. William Byron's right. Um, Michael McDowell's right. Uh, all those guys spoke, uh, a little bit about it when asked this week and why the drivers should care is because when the teams are healthy, we are going to pay more for their services. That is just normal. <laughs> That's just normal protocol. And, and you've seen over time and, uh, you know, driver salaries have gone down and, 
and I know that DBC talks about this quite often. You know, team mechanics have their salaries have gone down. Crew chiefs have gone down. Everyone in our sport has gone down except for one party. And that's the party that's on, on the other end of this, uh, on the other end of this lawsuit. Um, so everyone should care because the teams are the ones that has shouldered the burden of our revenue going down and down and down over time. And so what's happened is, you know, your drivers are typically one of your biggest ticket items, right? Of things that you have to pay. And so you, you pay the drivers, which you can afford to pay them. And every team is different and drivers salaries are on a very wide spectrum. Uh, there's some at the very, very top that are, you know, still, you know, close, and they're close. They're not at the peak of what it used to be, but it's close to it. And then you've really got another tier of, yeah, they're kind of in the middle of, you know, it's good, not great. And then you've got a lot of the field that is, you know, not making as much as an engineer makes. Like it's, it's really, really dispersed throughout the field. Um, and, and quite frankly, when you add up uh, what the entire driver salaries are all put together, what the drivers get paid. You know, this is in the three to five percent range. It's very, very low of total revenue coming in the sport. Um, you you can't equate that to any other sport whatsoever. And these guys are risking their lives um, when they strap in the car each and every week. So they should care uh, because over time, as you know, as time's gone on and, and the teams have become you know, less healthy, less healthy, um, for various reasons. It's just, they're the ones that are going to get the brunt of it because you know, it, that's the biggest ticket item that we have and we're going to pay what we can afford. I think there's probably some fans that listen to us and say, well, <clears throat> the top drivers in the sport make, make millions. You know, you guys are, mm -hmm. you guys are very well off. You drive safe cars every week. You make a lot of money. Why would, uh, healthy driver salaries, how would that change the total scope of the sport. Would you no longer be relying on sponsors to fund a go. driver's career? Yeah. Et cetera. Yeah. So that, what that does is allow us then to hire the best talent, best talent available, right? We're not at that point. We won't be looking for, well, does it financially make sense to hire this driver? Right. We're just going to say, you know, if, if we're in a healthier spot, we're going to say, give me the best guy. And if there's one or two people that are, head and shoulders above the rest, well, I'm going to pay a ton more for that guy because he's going to make the difference on my race team, especially in a world where we, um, you know, live in a world where the, the cars are very, very homogenous and, and are all the, all, all the same, basically. So um, drivers, crew chiefs, all of them, everyone should care about this um, because it affects everyone in the long run. Just well, been... well, yeah, we... <laughs> That was, we won't spend that much time on all of them. I think that was about 15 minutes. So um, well, let's mark that off, Jared, and then keep rolling. Watch, it's going to lean on it again. We got to keep going. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't. Well, there's Jared's choice on here. So we could come back to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, more lawsuit. <laughs> the wheel said we're not done. I think it's loaded. <laughs> I think the wheel's loaded. Oh, all right. Uh, two tire stop. I guess we're getting into to your race here a little bit. Um, yeah. So we just were really smart this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we we took two tires with 15 laps to go. Um, Did anyone else take two tires? I don't know that answer. Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, but. Regardless, we came in pit road, wherever we came in, we were probably about middle of the pack ish. Um, and he called me to pit road. Uh, I thought I did an okay job coming to pit road. Uh, we come in, we take two tires. I leave, um, pit road. And at that point, I'm the last car to come off, off pit lane. And I knew I had some damage. And so I didn't, I really couldn't tell much of the extent of the damage that I had most of the day because I was in the pack. I was, you know, I had a lot of air disturbed around me, so I didn't see, understand how slow my car was. Um, 
But when I came off the last car on pit road and I started to, as I'm going through the gears, I'm starting to see cars pulling away. I'm like, Oh, shit, this is not good. I'm, I'm going to lose the draft. And very quickly. And, and it's something with the aerodynamic package of this car. It's very easy to lose the draft. If you're the tail end, even if your car is healthy. Um, but I just had entirely too much damage. We spent, you know, too much time on the cycle. You know, it, it's somewhere between when I decelled off of turn four to when we left pit row, we spent too much time. I don't know where that time was and me and Chris will dive in it today. Um, but we came off last off pit road and, um, I lost the draft, but Just, it turned out to be <laughs> quite, quite the break. Yeah. I mean, you have now finished in the top 10 in the last nine Talladega playoff races. So if you're anything, you're consistent. I mean, you are. Wow. That's an interesting stat. I would have never <laughs> guessed that. Yeah. Tyler sent me that last night. He said, ask Denny uh, if he knows the, the answer to this. So, you, yeah, you I mean, have. it, uh, the damage, the damage was, was a killer for us, but you know, even so, even if we would have kept on to the back of that pack, we would have been at the tail end of that mayhem that happened. So, um, people that don't know, and you're kind of listening to the podcast, you didn't get to see the race. Um, there was a big wreck. We'll got, dive into that, but I fell off the back of the pack. And so I was probably about a mile away from the actual wreck when it happened. Um, so I avoided this 25 car pileup. Uh, because I was on the other side of the racetrack about a mile away. And so um, I know that when I went down the back stretch and I, all I saw was black skid marks on the racetrack, I, I looked and I'm, I'm like, you can kind of see how many cars are. I'm like, holy, shit, that's a lot of skid marks. There's a lot of cars in this. And when I came through the start finish line and I caught up to the back of the pack, there was only like, <laughs> eight cars in front of me and I knew I was last like 35th. I was just like, Oh wow. What a turn of events this was. Yeah. I mean, you're racing and then all of a sudden your spotter comes over and goes, reckon on the back, reckon on the back, reckon on the back. Oh, Jesus Christ. That means you're on the other side of the track. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, and so we don't have, uh, Lulu on there. Lulu's now the good luck dog. Y you would say that there's no question this weekend was absolutely fortunate luck. Correct. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, love I think gay part was he's like a perfect plan. I did all, you know, that was, you can tell I was in control, but your audio, I think 15 to go was the last thing that was said and there was nothing on your audio until wreck. Like were you just like there what there's nothing else to be said were you just hoping or what was going through your mind there? We didn't say a thing on the radio. No, I mean it was I, I just I, what can I say? I'm going as fast as I can, I'm holding it wide open and we're losing the pack at a quick rate. So I think you were you're going you're gonna, you were 15 back on the playoff cut at that were point. you aware of that that no i knew it was bad though i knew i was last what i mean yeah, there's only yeah. a couple cars out of the race <laughs> i knew i was last and i knew that all the playoff cars were in that pack about a mile away that i couldn't see so i think the the bigger question though that i have with you know this topic here is that why why does it seem like these green flag stops never go right for the 11 team like not once in this race did you come down pit road and then cycle mid pack. You were always come down pit road in the rear, stay in the rear. And if you're in the rear, you're supposed to be the guy who's saving the most, some the most, the most gas, right? You know, it's there's a lot of factors in it. I mean, it's you know the driver driver's got a huge, a huge responsibility to get on and off pit road and get into his box and all those things. All those things matter when it comes to when this pack is separated by you know, 1.5 seconds, you can lose a second in a really quickly. And so, you know, that's a factor, how much time you spend putting fuel in the car. I know typically we wait for fuel a lot. Um, so I just, I don't know. I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but until I kind of get it broken down to me today, um, I'm not really sure, but certainly we didn't, we weren't on the good end of the green flag cycles. Next spin here, Travis. <clears throat> Damage to the 47. So your race winner had a huge hole in his left side door. He had some door foam missing. 
He had a hole in his door. Um, this is where I, I think common sense would come into play. However, you do have rules. Um, do I think that the 47 should have come down um, and fixed or put bear bond over his door? Yes, by the letter of the law. That's what. That's why you make rules is so you, you, you have protocols and you enforce those rules. There's many wheels, topics on this wheel that, that we're going to be talking about rules. But they didn't. And, and when I heard Elton Sawyer say after the race, it was news to him that the 47 had a hole in his door. I'm not really sure uh, what, what we're doing. Um, it just seems like, you know, I, 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 I hear constantly from NASCAR a lot of reasoning behind calls that they make saying we didn't know. Um, we didn't have a good angle. We can't judge. Like, you have the resources to do it. Why aren't you? Uh, eventually, you have to hold your sanctioned body accountable to say you got to do better. And while I think it had no, do I think there's a safety problem with the 47 in what I saw in this car? I do not. I think that common sense, if there was no rule, common sense says he's fine. Just let him go. And he won the race. The, the issue is, is the rules. They didn't follow the rules, and this will be example number one. And they had plenty of time, too. We, like, we're going to get to it in a little bit, how much time we spent under caution. Like, it's not like it was a, click, a quick cleanup. And they, My guess is TV did not just ignore it. I don't, but I don't, I don't remember TV bringing up his door. Hmm. Section 3337 of the Cup Series rulebook states, A, Energy absorbing foam blocks must be installed on the outside surface of the left and right side door. And B, door foam that has been damaged or crushed must be replaced. Effective May 4th, 2022. Door foam that is missing skin, including all machine foams, must be replaced. It's one of many, Jared. I, I don't know what to say. We can make a huge deal about this, or we can make a really huge deal about the things that really played a huge factor in the results of the race, which is other topics on this wheel. This one did not. The 47, I mean, there, there's many others. There's many others I could add to this. But it right? passed inspection, though. How does that happen? Well, because that's a, that's a rule that typically gets enforced kind of in the race. Like, okay. they'll, they'll look at it and see. My, but there's, there's just so many others that you don't see. I, I know that the six and the 17 had the roof rails missing after the race. Did y'all know that? I didn't. The four got DQ'd after the race because he had bolts missing out of the windshield. You're the talking six about six and the 17 had their f right side fins gone. They were removed. When you say the four car got DQ'd, you're talking about, Last year with Harvick. Yes. Okay. Just then when people think. So what are we talking about here? This is, this is our, when you see Jeff Gluck and those guys really kind of getting agitated, this is what it is. It's so inconsistent. You have rules. And when you rule on one, one way, rule the same on the next. And so. Is it an accident that the six and the seventeen both had both pieces missing from their car post race? No, I, I don't care what excuse anyone tries to give. That you know, it was clearly manipulated in some sort of way to distort, and when it distorted, it fell off. So it's just one of many, and it and it makes it hard to sit here and maintain a neutral opinion about it because it just doesn't make sense on why sometimes it's a penalty, sometimes it's not. It just depends on... It makes you believe that there's bias in our series. And whether it's true or not, that's a perception. And sometimes perception is reality. 
Are the people that are doing the inspections and making these calls, are they the same week to week or is it a different group of people? Like, how's that go? Like, because like with other sports, it's kind of easy to understand. Like, what's the, how's it work for NASCAR? I, I don't know exactly. I would think, I would hope that they have the same people up there all the time. But this is three weeks in a row we're talking about the tower or we're talking about the officials post-race. Like, it's, they are just, we have enough chaos in our playoffs. We don't need them to add to it by bad officiating. Um, but for three weeks in a row, we're talking about them being topics of the results of our race. The goal for NASCAR in 2025 should have Elton Sawyer on TV less than five times a year. I should not know that guy's name. He should not be interviewed after every race. Yeah, and I, he's, he, he's, listen, they've got a tough job. We've stated that a million times. And there's been many times I've stuck up for NASCAR officiating because I, I, I need to hear it from their point of view. And, and I had conversations with Elton this morning because I, I, I said, listen, hey, I've, I've got to try to explain this. To get, I've got a few questions I need answered on on these other topics and so i wanted them to have ample opportunity and i heard what he said post race to the media members but now you know i have to try to explain to the audiences listening in how did we how did we get here how what was the mindset on on the rule changes so we'll get into it but it's um i, I want to be fair to everyone and and being fair is understanding that they have a tough job, but also it's it's understanding that they need to do a much better job than what they're doing. And eventually, we have to hold people accountable for not doing their job that well. I think we just forego one wheel spin here, and I get to just move it to whichever one says yellow flag lifted. Cars are allowed to pit, but yeah, go pace ahead. car doesn't it's, move. Yeah, red flag. Yeah, the red flag. Um, move it over one. One more. Nope. No, the other, other way. way. Yeah. There you go. Red flag. Yeah, so, I mean, on this topic, um, gosh, it, we, we could go on and on, and, and I just don't want, I guess I don't want to get into it for that much longer because it drives me crazy, but we we managed to change the rule from last week, and you will hear um, through some media outlets that they didn't change. They just interpreted it different. When Elton Sawyer started his press conference with the words, with this week, we decided to blank. That's all you need to hear. There's nothing, no more context you need to hear. And what he was saying is that we, we this week decided we wanted to err on the side of competition. To help the competitors out. They didn't notify any of the teams of that. That's the problem. If you change your mindset and say, this week we're going to do this, at least everyone knows. But you cannot start by saying, this week we decided blank. It ain't this week. You made a rule, stick to the rule. Don't change it because of how you feel that day or who's involved because, once again... You had the conspiracy theorists out there, and they're starting to get legs. They're saying, you are biasing this as favoritism to one team or organization. And it's starting to look that way based off of what you did. So there are many that benefited. I, I understand that part. Think about this, and I tried to explain this the best I could to them, that while you might be helping one or two, you've hurt 10 or 12 other organizations. Like, it, you ha it has a negative effect when you help, help someone out and sit to make sure they don't go a lap down. I'm not saying that they're, they got directly eyes on someone saying, we don't want them to go a lap down. But the choices you made allowed them to either fix their car while we're sitting over in turn two, not moving, or pushing them to their pit box, which we said we were not going to do and not change the rule until next year. Where, 
Who came up with the idea to allow it? That person must be held accountable. It doesn't make sense. And now it's harder and it gets harder and harder to justify why they're making the decisions they're making unless there's something we don't know. And that's, that's all I'll say. Well, you texted Elton Sawyer as a member of the media. Yeah, I wanted, you know, I said, listen, I've got a job this morning and for a couple hours, I need to be a media member. What's, what, why is this? And, and I, and I, and I hear him and I, I, I still don't agree with it. Um, you know, I understand. And let me give you his perspective is that, is that the DVP was never intended to take capable cars out of the race. Okay. It was never intended to take cars out of the race. I understand that. However, many capable cars have ended the race. I had no body damage at Daytona, but I had two broken toe links. And when they tried to push me, my car kept going in circles. So I said, it's over. Winning that down, I'm out. Had they towed me to the pit box, we could have fixed those toe links and kept on digging. So the problem is you can't change it now because other people's seasons have been decided by this rule in one way, shape, or form. You can't change it in the middle of your playoffs. You can't change your mindset in the middle of the playoffs. There's too many people affected. We're already in a bullshit round that we've had one legitimate racetrack. We're going to go to a a, a, a roval that's just going to be absolute ridiculousness. You're deciding people's seasons by making these choices, and it's just not fair to everyone. Make it fair to everyone by, you know what, it doesn't matter who you are, who you're with, what you, we go by the rule. And while Josh Berry's incident last week was stupid, it was by the rules. And so you got to live with it's by the rules. And that's why Josh Berry, after the race, says they better not be towing anyone in a pit box over there. They better not be. Yeah, I feel like their statement last week made it easy for them with this. Brad Moran clarified it. Did he not? Publicly. Yeah. We did it by the rules. So while it looked screwed up, and it probably was, it doesn't matter. We played by the rules. This weekend, they did not play by the rules. They changed them, and they changed their mindset and didn't notify one team member of that change of mindset. What's funny in all this is that what you're referring to is only just a small part of what happened yesterday. You're talking about cars, some cars being towed to the pit box, some cars being towed to the garage, but they also towed cars to the pit box and then let them start working on it while while we're you, sitting while there in a red condition. So they're and not I going laps. Down. I don't care what the the light was. That was a red flag condition because if the pace car is not moving, that's called a red flag. If the pace car is moving, it's called a yellow flag. Just because someone decides to turn on the lights doesn't change what the situation is. And if you look at the timestamp, when, when they lifted the red flag and put out the yellow caution light, we still didn't go green for another 25 minutes. So the red flag came out at 434.23 local Yellow was at 4.43.05, and it wasn't green until 5.07.13. So I'm saying, I've never been in a situation where we were red, then went yellow, and then didn't go green for another 25 minutes. That makes no sense. They, they wanted people to be able to work on their car. There's no other way you can justify this. So El- Elton Sawyer said... And, and, so, and so I listened to what the reasoning was and it was that we saw we said all right we got we got to get this cleanup going elton says you know this is taking too long we got to get these things going so we went yellow that doesn't make cleanup go any faster that makes it go slower because while we're going around the the wreck you're, you're keeping tow vehicles rollbacks and all that from moving because they have to navigate us like Stay red as long as you have to to get it cleaned up. That way, when we go yellow, we can go around once, get the one to go, let's go racing. 
That's the proper way to do this. And you can't touch your car while we're sitting there on the backstretch because how that affects the finish is that those, it is an art to the DVP clock for the teams. They, they find ways to repair these cars without going a lap down. But sometimes you have to go multiple laps down. But you use all of your DVP clock to get the car fixed because you know you got one shot to make minimum speed. Well, you've got cars that are limping around the racetrack that are know they can't fix it. They're just trying to make all the laps they can. And you got others, Chase Elliott brought it up, that didn't even make DVP clock that should have been multiple laps down, but they weren't. And then you got others that worked on their cars to avoid going a lap down because we're sitting in turn two, not moving under a yellow condition. It This order, this finishing order of Talladega was a sham at best. What's ironic is that these rules in general are put in place to make these decisions easy, right? Like last week, how you said the Josh Berry thing was a bit ridiculous, it, but it's it not was, ideal, but it was by the rules. And Brad Moran said it to us and he, and he explained it. He says, here's why we didn't do it is because he couldn't move. Right. And so while it stinks and it stinks for them, that was by the rules, but, but we felt like we messed up last week. So now this week we're going to change it, but we're not going to tell anyone we're going to change it until it happens. That is, that is just not acceptable. I'm sorry. People that don't want change and you want things. Hey, Larry Mack, you 67, 70 years. You don't want things change. This is why you got to have change because this is ridiculous. Does the race director make all the calls? Is there- I don't know. I don't know that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if it's by committee or there's one person or somebody is on the radio saying, release the red, let's go to yellow. And then there's somebody evidently that said, um, well, I can't go to yellow because there's the tracks blocked. They're still towing cars. And I told them on the radio, if you heard my radio, I said, Chris, they're nowhere near getting this cleaned up. There's still five cars sitting down there. But yet we went back yellow. When in a situation where everyone's fuel's tight and everything, I it just made no sense to me at all. And I it will be very interesting to see how others justify. All right, we're going to the wheel. Is there anything on here that we haven't covered yet? Yeah. Yeah. Jared's choice. Oh gosh, I'm not prepared for this. Well, look at the wheel. Yeah. Tell me what you want to tell you. T- oh, he just moved it one. The big one. The big one. Oh, the big one. Holy cow. What happened there? <laughs> um, I, I went back and watched it. I, I looked at, I looked at his data as much as I could. And it just felt like to me as, as someone that does this, that the 21 and the 22 just kept pushing the six and didn't get off of them. And obviously the six is coming to the two car with such a run that, uh, and, and I think Brad tweeted it that, you know, he, listen, I'm trying to lift, you know, he didn't lift a lot by the way, but he, he did lift some and he did hit some brake to try to slow down the run, but he just got shoved into a wreck. And unfortunately for those guys that kind of probably initially caused it, which is the 22 and the 12, uh, and the 21, um, you know, they got, they got bit by, <laughs> by, by the actions that they started. So, um, you know, we, we see this a lot, certainly with this next gen car, the runs get big and it, I mean, this thing took out everyone, 25 cars. <laughs> yeah. It took out so many cars. And so, um, it's just, uh, yeah, they were coming with a run and, and it's not like, Cindric put a bad block on or anything like that. He just got out there and you know, the, these, these, that inside line started stacking up. Did when Todd Gillen say stack? I looked at that. I, I didn't think that Todd Gillen had a huge role in this. I, I saw the people were mentioning that, you know, we went by him and, but I just, I don't know. I mean, maybe it had an effect with the air that allowed them to bunch up the way they did. But you know, this is on, the spotters of the 21 and 22 to say that 
you know, while you're shoving this six, yes, you know, he's two, you got two car lengths ahead. You have to plan that that gap is going to close really quickly. And so you got to get off the guy. And they didn't. And it caused a wreck. Is this the downside of the Fords? They're so good at pushing, but maybe they got too aggressive. Well, they were certainly aggressive. I don't know if it's a downside. Uh, certainly the, the Fords have um, dominated qualifying, things like that. So it's just, uh, yeah, I don't, I just don't think so. I just think this was driver error, driver and, and or spotter errors um, that, that caused the big one. And so um, that's really the only two or three gar- cars you really got to talk about because it's, you know, everyone else is just collateral damage at that point. I mean, was it error though, or is it just the fact that we finally got to a point in the race where you guys could race and not save, save fuel? There wasn't a point in this race prior to this where you looked like you were going to wreck. Well, we, I mean, we allowed there to be plenty of photo ops of four wide, but we're not, no one was going anywhere. Um, we were all log jam, we're all saving fuel kind of at, at those points of the race. So, um, it, there just wasn't much movement. Um, there wasn't a lot of aggressive pushing throughout the day, just simply because most of the day was all fuel saving and it was fuel saving for the whole field. Are you in the car thinking like with, I don't know, five to go, I guess you got to hypothesize here cause you're on the other side of the track, but, um, are you like frustrated? Like I can't go anywhere. Like, Oh yeah. Just like, yeah, I was like uh, the second or third car on the top of four wide, the top middle of the four wide. And like we're all going nowhere because the front cars they don't want to run any more than half throttle, and everyone behind them's running you know a third throttle, and everyone's just trying to save fuel because you know that passing with this next gen car on a super speedway is so hard that we're we're trying to spend the least amount of time on pit road. So when that green flag cycle happens, we're towards the front of it because it essentially guarantees you a good finish if there's not a wreck. Uh, because once the, the, this thing goes two, three wide, the cars have so much drag, you cannot pull out of line. Hence, let's just spin this over two notches to the final restart. It's why, one more. No, one more. Other way, other way, other way, other way. Other way. Other way. Other. Good. S- one more. We'll talk about the final restart here. Kyle Busch went from trying to win the race to dead last of the cars running. Because he tried to pull out of line. And nobody went with him. You can, these things do not let you pull out of line because they have so much freaking drag on them. So, you know, while I, I saw some complaints on, on X about, you know, wow, that last green white checker was pretty mild and tame. We're all just trying to stay in line because if you pull out of line, it's over. Unless you have a brigade of cars that are willing to go with you, um, it's done. And so, you know, those, those days are over. You have to stay in line, which is why track position is so important, which is why we save fuel the entire day is to just limit that time on pit road. So it's just, it, this is a, it's, it, it's a compounding issue that it's showing up. You know, this is a car thing that turns into a fuel thing which turns into a track position thing. And that's why you're seeing the kind of racing that we've had. What did you think was going to happen when you were riding on the front stretch and every other car was on the back stretch? Were you resigned to finish in P30? Uh, I had no choice. I was going to finish P30 something. But did you think they were going to wreck? Uh, I did. I just didn't know if it was going to happen on the, on the white flag lap. That's typically when they do wreck. And so by then it's too late. You're not going to get a restart. So I, I thought that, and, and, and you don't know if it's a one car wreck, two car wreck or whatever, but a 25 car wreck was just icing on the cake for me. <laughs> Not that it was a different strategy, but did you feel like a little like redemption for Atlanta or like see guys? <laughs> yeah. I, the, um, no matter how we try to spin it, this was not, uh, this was lucky. And, and I talk about luck in our sport a lot and we were on the floor. Very, very fortunate end of it. Jared, would you? I had, did not think they were going to wreck. There was no sign throughout this entire race besides Ross pushing, pushing Kyle at the end of stage one through yeah. the corner that, that you were going to wreck. 
that any of these cars are going to wreck. They just look too stable. Yep, you're you're right. And and again, we're all just trying to save fuel the entire time. And, and so the only time we're not is inside that last fuel window, and that's when everyone was three wide, not going anywhere. <laughs> right. And also looking at the guys who were up front. You know, you have William Byron, you have other playoff drivers. If I'm their crew chief, I'm their spotter, I'm saying, hey, just finish this race. Just get to the checkered flag. We're plus 35 here. Look at the big picture. We don't need to do anything stupid that would end up or, or put us in the garage here at the end of this race. So I, I figured, yeah, what What are you telling me to do? Just go over one. This way or this yep, way? No, that way, yep. So trying to knock off all these. Bowman Blaney is what the we're on. The Bowman Blaney, that, that's exactly who is maybe the biggest benefactor of the big wreck. Was it me or Blaney? You. You? You. And it's really? not your, season, close. your season was Your season was, was done. I wasn't. I, I was You're going to make up 17 win, points at the Roval? I was going to win the Roval. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Bowman Blaney thing, can as drivers... I'm starting to see a trend. Whenever you wreck someone, you just say, man, I hate it. I I hate it that that happened. I saw two weeks in a row with uh, Briscoe and now Bowman. Man, I just, I hate it for them. And yeah, right. You're just trying to say whatever you can to make them not pissed at you, which is a good idea. Very good idea. Um, Bowman ran into Blaney and, and crashed him, and that was where I got my damage. I ran in the back of the 22 because um, I was right there in the middle of it. Um, yeah, I mean, Blaney went from, I don't know where he was before that big wreck, but it, he had to have been in the negative. No no question, right? Because um, he was last, and all the playoff guys were towards the front. But when that big wreck happened, I mean, Blaney has got to be jumping up and down in his bus saying, Thank you. I've got friends back here, playoff friends that are going to finish in the 30s, just like me. So he didn't lose as much. And in, in fact, he's actually in a pretty decent spot, plus 20-something. Yeah, he's in a great spot, <laughs> Con <laughs> wow. considering where he was. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's not much you can say about the Bowman Blaney thing. Bowman just pushed him wrong and coming to the line. Like, I just... I didn't really see a big benefit in pushing right there at the line. Like you're not going to, there's nothing to gain. I don't think, um, in that instance, uh, you're locked in whatever position you're, you're pretty much at. Um, so just a push gone wrong. You get like one spot. Maybe one thing we've noticed though, is it, is it pays to be the one that actually causes the wreck or, or makes the first initial contact, right? The six got away with on the two, Right, and then Bowman ended up free and clear from the the Blaney wreck. So when all else fails, just hold the gas down and run into him. Is a wreck though inevitable at that point? Like when a car, it seems like when a car is backing up, like Blaney was backing up in the middle, right? Bowman's come in, Blaney's backing mm -hmm. up. So so Bowman's probably then trying to battle somebody side by side with him. More than likely, that's probably why he was pushing the twelve or trying to get the 12 to go is that he's probably Bowman's probably got people on both sides of him that he's racing to the line. So he doesn't want to slow his momentum by checking up for the 12 who's backing up. Instead, you just try to push him to keep your momentum going. Right. However, my if, guess that's, that's what happened. If Bowman checks up, there's no brake tail lights on the brake lights on these cars. If he checks up, the guy behind him is just going to continue yeah, his but, speed, right? But Aren't it's, they like eventually a, it's like a chain reaction on a highway though. It, the the wreck happens because people react late. If as long as you react quick enough and start to slow down your speed, you know when you see you're catching him at a really really fast pace, you start checking up your speed well before you actually get there. It's it's the wrecks happen when you're going wide open, wide open, and all of a sudden, bam, you slam on brakes. That's when the chain reaction happens because eventually somebody's not going to be able to catch up to that. So Bowman's not avoiding himself getting wrecked by checking up and slowing down that's what i'm asking yeah he's um 
He's not avoiding. Say it. Ask that again. Like if Bo- Bowman's not thinking there, well, if I start checking up here, then Larson's just going to get in the back of me and I no, could be the guy I, going I think around. he's just trying to battle the cars beside him. That's, that's more than likely what it was. Got it. There's no way we don't land on something we've already talked about. Lawsuit. Oh, no. Hey. No. Suarez wreck. Suarez wreck. I wanted to get to that. What the hell was he doing? <laughs> I, I, you listen to the end car, and you're thinking, well, maybe the spotter told him to get up. The spotter did not. I have no idea what Daniel was doing or thinking in that moment um, because he was going so much slower than the pack. Uh, but there was a two-car width gap between the last car that passed and then BJ. And he thought that just turning right, right in front of BJ was the, a good idea. Now, thinking about this, what it could have caused is a chain reaction, then caused a caution, <laughs> and then he got his lap back. So I'm wondering, the conspiracy theorist to me is like, was he trying to cause a caution to get his lap back? Like, create some chaos, right? Clearly, he wanted a chaos because he put himself right in the middle of the pack when they're coming on him 20 miles an hour faster. He's zigzag. I'm watching. He's zigzagging kind of, where am I going to go? I'm going to make you all think. Am I going to go high? Am I going to go low? And then finally, the field splits them, and then they get behind him, and they're like, this guy's not going. They split him again. And he's going so slow that there's just you, – you got to just – Take your lumps, your lap down. You're the only car lap down. Just get to the end of the stage. You'll be okay. Or the green flag pit cycle. There could be a caution there. But he takes a abrupt right, right into front of BJ, and there's no way BJ could have reacted in time given the difference in mile per hour, and he crashed himself. I mean, your spotter on the radio way before this is, hey, 99's getting past. He's going to cause havoc. He's going to cause havoc. It was Everyone saw it coming. Yeah, it just, you know, it. fortunately for the field, Daniel and his team were the ones that got the bad end of the stick. But they very well could have screwed other people over by him, you know, making this chaotic move that just, that, that wasn't, that's not ideal for sure. Um, not at the speeds we're going and it just, that was, that was ill-advised. Is there a benefit? to blending with the pack there? Like, is he worried that he's not going to be able to latch on to the tail and then he's going to have to do this again in five more laps or whatever it is, and then he could go two down? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a worry. You don't want to go two down for sure. Um, but he was going to blend. There was enough cars lagging at the back of the pack that he was going to be able to blend with some of them. Like, you know, not everyone was in the, the racing pack, the Peloton. So you had enough stragglers in the back that he was going to be able to blend and still stay one down. So this is just a stupid move. You said it. <laughs> I feel like DBC won't have an issue picking their what an idiot this week. <laughs> uh, we're getting down to it. Come on. I think Ricky went. Yeah, no, it's your choice. It's a pick one we haven't talked to, talked about. And Ricky wins. Yeah, go over two. One, two. So let's finally talk about the winner. Um, Ricky Stenhouse gets his fourth win. Yep, two at Daytona, fourth, two at Talladega. Yeah, fourth win um, on a super speedway and, and the fourth win of his cup career. Um, this is an awesome deal for Ricky. And uh, certainly, you know, he's had probably a lackluster season um, in comparison. However, if you just look at if you want to create a soundbite out of this, he's won now in back-to-back years. Uh, won at Daytona 500 last year. Won at Talladega this year. Um, it's a big deal for the team. Um, certainly, there's been some rumors swirling ar- around you know where that team goes at the end of this year. Um, whether it's you know rebranded, um, what what will they have for sponsorship at the end of the year? Uh, but this certainly can go a long way for them to help you know, this team continued to survive and thrive. I mean, I remember him saying top 15, they get bonuses there. That just shows, yeah. you know, kind of where that team is at. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's kind of unfortunate for them because, you know, winning in the playoffs when you're not part of them 
it doesn't really do anything for you in the play in the in the you know financially like it did for the Wood Brothers. You know they go from wherever they were in points and they jump up twenty spots or fifteen spots. You know this is just gonna you know help them a little bit, uh, but but it's more of a big morale boost for him and his team. And as they look towards the future and what that holds for them. Um, it's certainly they can use this as fuel to you know want to keep this train going. Can they race and get at least to like seventeenth? Is that pay or where, what? I don't think they're they're too far back. I think to to get there. Um, but uh, I don't know where that set race for seventeenth is. But they at, can though. Right? So like the non playoff drivers yes, are racing yes. for sixteenth. Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah. Any non playoff driver and team is is racing to try to get to seventeenth points. That's the highest you can get. You can argue that now in the next gen era that driver skill at these super speedways you know doesn't matter all that much but here again we see a winner ricky stenhouse jr who's clearly a guy who's good on super speedways finds his way up front and and does win the race yeah it uh it certainly is is something that uh i believe it's diminished driver skill uh just simply because of the track position and whatnot but you continue to see some of the same characters up front um, and so you can't deny that or, or, you know, discredit those that are, that are finishing well at these super speedways. And so, uh, they're doing a good job. You got to study what they're doing, um, constantly evolve, you know, your craft to figure out, you know, listen, everyone's got the same rules that they're racing by and, and they're going to crown a winner today. How is it going to be you? And so I think that they found a way. And uh, they did it through, you know, several different avenues. But in the end, you know, we had to have a winner. The 47 put themselves up front when it really counted. He uh, really uh, knows how to celebrate and climb fences. <laughs> yeah. I think he was trying to show off some of his athletic ability. Sliding down the rails. Jeez. Yeah. 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 So uh, he's got works out hard uh, on his fitness, and he was showing that off there post-race. So uh, hats off to him. It's, it's certainly big. He's a new dad, too. Uh, Stetson, right? Stetson. Yeah. Yeah. Stetson's, uh, got to be part of victory lane via FaceTime. We saw, so he's got a win sticker. This is big for, for a team like that. I got to say before, um, Ricky became a dad, he did used to come to cliffhangers with me. So, oh, I don't know if, did you teach him? I, those moves? I don't, I'm not going to say that. Who I'm can not, get up the harder walls? You or him? Me, me, me. You, you are. He, I mean, he's obviously stronger, but, uh, strength only gets you so far. Yeah. Well, I've looked on the wheel. Hold on. We only have one thing left, and I think it's a perfect wrap-up, and that is the Roval. Uh, how, where do uh, I it's like go? the wheel knows. It started with the lawsuit. It ends <laughs> right? with the Roval. It, it knew. Uh, go this way, three. One, two, three. Well, four. Sorry. So the Roval. Um, yeah, this weekend is is going to be interesting. Let's start with the reconfigure. The reconfigure was designed to create more chaos. There's, you're, you're going to have to convince me otherwise of that. Um, they made corners sharper and tighter. Um, they had an, they had actually, uh, a corner in turn seven. It was tight in turn seven anyway, back when it was the old configure, now the new configure, but now they, they made it to a point. So instead of you driving the normal optimum line to make this corner that is really, really tight, tighter than the Coliseum, it, they made it a point. So they want you to drive straight in the corner, I believe, and wipe out whoever's in front of you. And then it's going to be a parking lot in turn seven. And then it's just going to be who can navigate and get through there. So I don't know why we changed it. Um, there's a blind spot when you go through five to six, like you go over a rise and your car like gets really high and, and in the sim it gets airborne, but it doesn't, um, it probably won't in real life. But we were always joking about like, surely enough, like SMI or somebody's going to put a jump at one of the racetracks here soon. And they've done it. They've done it. So we get to experience, um, this new Roval config and I don't know. It's uh, I, I don't know what else to say about it other than uh, try to qualify and try to avoid the wrecks. That's, that's about it. But you know, this is it. Uh, this is what we are now. 
folks. And so anyone that's um, griping about, well, you, you're complaining about this, that, and the other, I tell you, this is the avenue we're choosing. Is it, cho- is, it, is it making for more viewers or not? And so I, I, I just don't know. I don't know what we're doing, why we're doing it. You know, we got a great oval that's at that racetrack. While I'm walking around the roval, I'm looking at the banks of the oval thinking, man, it'd be awesome to, to run on, on that racetrack. You do. You do run on the banks of the roval. I, I hear you. And it's been a fantastic race <laughs> many, many, many times. But we're No, I run. mean, next this Sunday, you will run on the banks of the roval. Oval. <laughs> right, right. I, I see where you're going with that. But um, I don't know. I, I, I thought that the Roval has just run its course, but I think they changed the track to try to create some sort of, um, you know, something to sell some tickets on and, you know, come out and, and watch, the, uh, watch the clown shows. We're the clowns, by the way. All the drivers, we're the clowns. And so uh, we'll, we'll give it to you this weekend. Hopefully we get through the playoffs and then we get to some real racing here in the next round. I think the next round is going to be key for the 11 team. If we can get there, uh, it, it will be on from that point on. Fortunately, you can probably just stay out at the end of each one of these stages, pick up some stage points, finish 18th. Yeah, I don't know. Um, 30 to the good. Yeah, it, it passing will be extremely difficult. There's no question about that. Passing will be where are the passing so zones? hard at, at the, the ro- ro- of all the of all the road courses. The roval's the hardest to pass on, just because simply because it you know the braking zones. It's narrow. Um, we're out of control on the banks, you know, because we our cars are set up to be running on the infield, and then when we go on the bankings, like our cars are so out of control and. The things that are different from this year to the next or from last year is that the aerodynamic package is different. So, you know, spoilers, different size, the underbodies, the simple diffuser. So we don't have as much underbody downforce. Um, so it's it's going to be out of control on the on the big track. And, you know, it's going to be hard to pass in the, in the infield. So it'll be difficult. It's going to be the same for everyone, though. So it's just about can you qualify well and avoid the wrecks? And if you can do that, you'll be good. Do you think anyone below the cut line is in a must-win scenario? Is Joey Logano in a must-win scenario at minus 13? No. 13 is you can overcome that. The problem is is that he's going to have to overcome it versus Chase and some really good road course racers that are right above that line. How many points do you need? Ten. Probably 10. You you got nine last year. (laughs) You were 50 to the good, though. That was how many? You were 50 to the good last year. You got nine. I think all those nine were probably stage points. (laughs) You finished 37th, I think. God dang. Oh, gross. Do you remember what happened? I remember that I was running well. I qualified inside the top 10. Gapehart decided to keep me out to get some stage points. The next thing you know, I was at the back of the pack, couldn't pass a soul. I was back there. I went from running top five lap times to dead last. And then I think I spun out or wrecked. Or I don't know I what I did. Twice. You spun out and then you got wrecked again or something. I forget. Uh, and Travis, do you have career stats for Denny at the Oval? At the no, Roval? Get, uh, let's not. No. <laughs> I no, don't. No. You're but, no, no, we're not. We're not doing that. <laughs> don't, don't do it. What did uh, what did MJ say to you at the end of that race yesterday? Uh just good job avoiding it all. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Uh, you know, I we th- you know we were talking about. You know, he's like, all of our cars are to the plus, so that's 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 uh, that's a good thing when he says all of our cars. He inc- he always includes us. He he he, he says I'm. I'm, since I'm a Jordan guy, I'm, you know, we're part of the team as well. The 11 car is part of the 2311 team. Yeah. So I love that he sees it that way. I wonder what he was thinking 15 laps prior. Like, what an g- idiot. <laughs> 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 uh, anything else we got to touch on here, Travis? Well, you want to go with the review? Yeah, we got a review here. This one comes from Jay Hint 22. 20- 22 big nascar fan and love the podcast denny provides a great perspective from a driver's point of view denny can talk 
about what is like being in Post Malone's music video with Bubba. Curious how that came to be. Speaking of, Post Malone's here in Charlotte tonight. Mm, he is. That's right. Um, yeah, be interesting. That'll be fun. Um, appreciate that review there, J Hint twenty two. Uh, thanks for the the feedback there, and certainly. Uh, appreciate all y'all tuning in. Hold for, on, you didn't answer the question. What? what? What's the question? How did that come to be? How, How are you getting oh, oh, oh. music video? Um, I think it came to be because they, when they were shooting the video, it was at Auto Club Speedway in California, and they needed NASCAR's approval to use NASCAR cars in the video, and then they, um requested i think some drivers be in it and so is that somewhat accurate austin good enough okay um and then so we just you know got volunteered and so it was a lot of fun you know i i definitely realized that i don't know if you consider post malone a rapper but in that he was a rapper right they definitely do things on their own schedule and so it was a pretty laid back um video shoot right there was a there was a lot of partying and a little bit of work but it turned out really really good <laughs> was that is that the only music video you've been in i i think so yeah yeah motley crew by post malone if you want to look it up on youtube all right <clears throat> be sure all to right. rate review follow wherever you listen to your podcasts and click subscribe on the YouTube channel. This is one, if you're listening on audio, you're going to want to see the wheel spin. So head over to YouTube, um, subscribe. The full video is up every Monday. Well, we did it. We got through the wheel. Well, ju- well done, guys. Hour 20. It's impressive. Yeah. All right. We'll see you next week. <laughs>